Now that it seems like everything is virtual and we're all working together over great distances, what do we need to know about how to empower teams, how to get the best performance out of teams, how to create amazing teams and how to maintain them, how to take care of ourselves, how to take care of our, our teammates, what are some strengths of the new way of working together, what are some, or some, some opportunities, what are some threats, um, and how can we bring kindness and, dare I say, even joy into all of that? Well, stay tuned. Hello and welcome to Ericsson Live on another Wednesday evening. It is evening for us in Europe and in Africa. Um, if you are tuning in from Europe and Africa, this is a bit early for you. This is one hour earlier. That's because Canada already went over to daylight savings time. So we're doing a bit of um, jump roping with, uh, with the time zones here. Uh, in two weeks, it's going to shift again for the Europeans. So uh, all fun and games. And that is actually something that we have to consider when we work in teams, don't we? Because when we work across uh, different time zones, there's all kinds of things. There's uh, holidays, there is uh, time zone changes to take care of and to consider. So all of these tiny little things that might make um, working together a little bit harder. Um, but if we set it up right, that can actually even bring us closer together. So. Welcome, welcome. Um, as always, I'd love to know where you're joining us from. So I'm joining from Nairobi, as always. Our guest today, I'll already tell you, is joining us from Prague in the Czech Republic. So where are you joining us from? And also, we'd love to know what's your biggest challenge? What are your burning question around questions around how to work together as teams, how to bring virtual teams closer together in these long distance times, in these social distanced times? How can we how can we come closer together in these in these social distance times? So uh, with that out of the way, let me introduce Halka. Halka uh, is a fantastic uh, colleague of mine, a role model of mine. Uh, she's been working in the area of training and development since 1994 when she got her MBA at Durham University Business School. She has thousands, literally thousands of training hours experience using advanced NLP and coaching principles in her highly sought after transformational programs. In coaching, she specializes uh, on working with teams and team leaders, helping the clients to reach high effectiveness and joy at the same time. Uh, her mission is to support the development of human potential and help individuals and teams to reach long-term growth and abundance, balanced with happiness at work and in personal life. Her motto is business in joy, since she's convinced that only what we enjoy doing is also worth living. Halka, uh, very warm welcome to you. I do hope that you will enjoy being with us on the live stream. <laughs> Fabian, thank you so much. I have been in Kenya, it's two years ago, and we met there. You were thinking about your campfires and you are doing it. And I am so happy for you. I just think that when we see the right idea, it's possible. So I want to congratulate you on uh, those broadcasting because I think it really was a challenge and you are doing such a great job. Thank you for inviting me for this dialogue. Thank you. Thank you so much. Your check is in the mail <laughs> um, for, for saying such kind words up front. Um, all right. So um, we already have people tuning in from all over the world, which is apart from having the chance to chat with such amazing guests such as yourself, um, having all these people uh, tuning in and contributing to the discussion is just what I appreciate most about doing this. And we have Natasha joining from Macedonia. We have Andrea from Croatia. We have Yassi mm. from Brazil, so another one of our, our lovely esteemed colleagues. Hello, have, Yassi. Yeah, <laughs> bom dia. Uh, we have uh, Mako from bom Jakarta dia. in Indo Indonesia. We have Donia from Saudi Arabia. We have somebody whose name isn't visible from to me right now from, from Riga in Latvia. Uh, we have somebody joining from Nairobi, Kenya, somebody else. Um, I know there's somebody in Germany watching, so hi there. Um, so. 
lots and lots of different people um, who I'm sure have networks all over the world. Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, and Nevzad is joining us from Turkey. So, Halka. Um, oh, and again, everybody, uh, thank you for, for letting us know where you're from. Please also let us know what's your yeah. biggest challenge in terms of working together, collaborating online with teammates, with people that you work with in general. What is something that you might be missing from working in person? And what would you like us to address in terms of how might you recreate or how might you create something different but, but equivalent uh, online in the virtual space? So, so let us know what we can address for you so that this, this really provides you with the most value possible. Okay, Halka, so finally over to you. Um, <laughs> uh, you, I know that, that you are a black belt and I think even a third dan in Aikido. So it's a Jap fourth, so, hey, so you've been busy in the meantime. Congratulations. <laughs> um, so con yeah, that, that's amazing. Aikido though, is a sport that doesn't necessarily strike me as a team sport, right? And um, so I'm just curious, um, what's your history with, with teamwork in general? And I know this is a huge question, but just where would you like to take us on, on the beginning of your journey towards um, really appreciating teamwork? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, you asked me basically two questions, my listening ears, you know, something about Aikido and something about my team history. So let me address the first one. Aikido uh, is a Japanese martial art, which is not attacking one, but it's a defensive one. And if we translate Aikido into our, our language, uh, basically in Japan, Aikido, we need to read it from the back to front. So it's a journey of energy in harmony. It's a journey of energy or energies in harmony. Aikido was founded and named uh, by a Japanese master, Morihei Ueshiba. He created Aikido after the Second World War, and he was a martial artist in many martial, martial arts. And he kept saying that to kill somebody is really easy. To keep life or even to heal is really an art and for this we need to study for the whole life because our instincts are instincts of killing reaction fight or flight or freeze and aikido works with energies in such a way that in on your journey you start to you learn yourself how to work with the energy coming and not push web backwards, not going against it. In Aikido, we use something which is called a third point. The third point means that when there is an energy coming, you don't, you don't escape that energy. You neither go against this energy, but you first go into the third point. And this is because I guess that we have a lot of coaches who know what coaching position is. So this is a coach position or coaching observation position. It's a position of the third point. You know, it's neither me, neither that person, but outside from where you can observe the situation. And then you can decide. You can usually in Aikido, you go with the energy first and then you deviate the energy so that you protect yourself, but you also protect your partner. So if you already started with this question, there is a lot for teamwork because if you take the philosophy and principles of Aikido, you can translate them di directly into cooperation with other people. So there is a link, even uh, though it doesn't look like. Yeah, interesting. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, I'll, I'll be curious to, to see how you can tie in the Aikido once we bring in kind of the, the teamwork elements. I'll, I'll be curious to see how you, because it, it's really, really interesting indeed. Okay, mm, so yeah. Halka, I know you consider yourself to be somebody who has not always been a team player. And yeah, um, that's true. You, you, you went on quite a journey. Um, you, from kind of um, teaching, 
and preaching certain principles about teamwork to at some point really um, taking them within yourself and and, and really, um, yeah, just integrating that into what it is that you do yourself. So I'm curious, wh where does that journey start? Where, wh what was the, um, yeah, your initiation into kind of team coaching, teamwork, and, and kind of take us a little bit on a ride there? Yeah, okay. Yeah, Fabian, you, you are absolutely right. We shared, you know, I was preparing for this discussion a little bit in the morning, and I said, my goodness, what led me to this teamwork? And I really reflected in today in the morning on my journey that I did. And I realized, and I truly want to share with all of you, that I was not a team player at all. I grew up in a Czechoslovak Socialistic Republic, and that's important. I would like to say something about it. And uh, all the socialistic bloc uh, were designed to have high performance sport people who proved that we are good. And I was one of them. Uh, when I was something like seven or eight, I started to do modern rhythmic gymnastic and I became really good. I was something like on the third place in the Czechoslovakia. I was also in the representation team. So I represented, I also traveled a little bit. Um, and I loved modern gy rhythmic gymnastic, but it's a solo sport. You know, you do it for yourself. You see other people, other we, we were friends, but uh, you mostly see them as your opponents, truly. It's, there is no teamwork. And then I started to do diving, which is uh, jumping to water diving. I suddenly became, because I had very good preparation physical, I started to be very good, and then I switched to diving. And for four years during my secondary school, I was in representational team and a very good coach, uh, a lady, here in the Czech Republic who trained the Olympic winners, I did diving. But you can imagine, diving is not a team sport. You are the only one on the board. And what you do is your business. So uh, that was my upbringing. And what I want to say about the environment where I grew up, uh, I think it's very important for many people. We come from different nations. We have different backgrounds and different history. And sometimes we do not realize how deeply it influences us. So what I know from my mother, for example, and that's very important for teams. Um, I'm very curious about where I'm coming from. So I asked my parents a lot, a lot of questions recently. And one day my mother told me, you can't imagine where, where you grew up, where we all were growing up. When I was born um, in the 70s, you know, um, my mother told me, you were little and we couldn't even speak in front of you in the kitchen. We were all the time afraid if we share some deep information with you or something that we truly think about, that we would go to prison. And that was a real threat. And so sharing information or talking about our emotions or even talking about our needs or talking about something deeper than what we are going to have as a dinner or where we are going for vacation or something like that, that was under my scope. I, I didn't, I knew nothing about that. So, you know, high performer, I was truly highly intelligent. You know, I went through schools like nothing, even when I did a lot of sports. But uh, I realized when I came out of, of schools that I have almost no friends. So that was my the beginning of my career. You know, I was not a team player at all, you can say. I was very lonely. Moreover, I am an introverted person. So here you guess, you know. Yeah, I, I do recognize what you're saying in terms of dynamic on, on um, growing up on the eastern side of the Iron Curtain uh, is um, when, when I teach um, the art and science of coaching, uh, in, in former Soviet countries, you do notice, I find, that people are more reserved and more hesitant to share and to really open up. And that is, I mean, it's 2020, you know, it's it's been 30 years, but it, that's something that must be just really, really ingrained. And um, to add a German perspective, we are still um, a little bit foreign to each other, Western Germans and Eastern Germans, just because of um, how different people grew up the curtain yeah yeah exactly. uh, it's and it's it's 
yeah so I, I really recognize what you're saying so um, so starting from that from that really kind of closed off like ironically no individualistic focus in in communism which is a bit counterintuitive in a way um, uh, how, how do you then get to a place where, where you get interested in teamwork and you start teaching about it mm -hmm. Uh, I was very lucky in my life. Uh, when I see my life backwards, it was one, uh, as uh, Marilyn Atkinson, our teacher, says, one synchronicity after another, you know, one good luck after another. So uh, the good luck that I had when I finished the uh, university studies and I studied plant biotechnologies, you know, plants were my best friends. You can talk to plants whenever you want. <laughs> and, and they, they won't are still you. my best yeah. friends. <laughs> yeah, you know, and they, they don't uh, argue with you. That's good. So I, I had this diploma in engineering. I tried to find a good job in my, my area, but I couldn't find anything because it was just after when the curtain came down. And so I just put an advertisement in the newspaper, young, with a good English, because I was fluent in English already by that time, with computer knowledge, seeking a good, interesting job. I got a reply from uh, some American company. I went for an interview. It was uh, September. It was something like third week. It was getting dark already. And I said, hey, it's time to do something now, you know, earn some money or whatever. And I spoke with a beautiful person. He was a manager. His name was Steve Minsky. I remember still his name. He was young, 28 years, you know, really good looking, uh, tall, black hair, black eyes. And uh, for the whole interview, I spoke about my traveling and all of that. And so at the end of the interview, he said, well, uh, I'm really interested to take you. So when can you start the job? And I was reflecting deeply. It was Thursday. I said, what about Monday? And he said, Monday is good. And so on Monday, I started to work for Apple computer. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> that small startup. I don't know if anybody heard of it. Yeah, that's just, you know, just a, I had no clue what Apple, what Apple is, what Apple was, you know, you can imagine that after that, it was 1991, when this happened, uh, that was completely new, but I soon understood what it was about. So first we worked with the most modern technology possible in the computer world, if you want, but what was uh, breaking through, um, I noticed completely different culture style of work. First, my two bosses, Steve and Jennifer, they were very friendly. They took us as partners. Uh, they let us work completely independently. He never checked me out. He never yelled uh, on me. Uh, he, he was like a friend. It was rather like friendship, uh, leadership. I, I can't even name it. Uh, we did a lot of creative stuff. Uh, now I know the word co-creation. I didn't know it there, then, by then. But uh, what we did was basically we co-created events, we co-created cups, we co-created marketing campaigns. Uh, they gave us reading all the time to read about marketing and sales and everything. They were eager to teach us. And I said, oh my goodness, this is heaven. This is heaven. I never knew that something like uh, was possible. And there was like a seed of an idea. I was observing uh, the companies starts up in the Czech Republic. Um, many companies, state companies with this old structure and old leadership. And I said, we need this. We need to get this into the Czech Republic. And that was my wish. And then the universe wanted, uh, uh, I was, I, I got, uh, um, you know, a grant. I went to uh, Durham in the United Kingdom, uh, based on British money. I did my MBA very soon in 1994. Nobody knew what it was about, neither me. <laughs> At that time, I came back to the Czech Republic, and my, when I said I said MBA, it was like somebody speaking Japanese, so nobody understood what is it good for. <laughs> and the only thing, you know, that. Uh, I wanted to work for a big company, but uh, then a friend of mine from uh, the university told me, look, uh, you have really a lot of ideas from uh, your MBA studies. What if we set up an educational company for managers? Wow, that was a click. 
And I said, yes, let's do it. And then I was free, you know, for a couple of years, I was working on this project. We were organizing already in 1994, 1996 uh, programs for managers. And we did what? The things that I was interested in. Communication skills, negotiation. I understood that there is something like assertiveness. I understood that there is something that you can deal with your time, some time management and creativity, you know, and I was like in heaven. That was a heaven for me. Well, that was my beginning in human development. Wonderful. Yeah, no, it sounds like even when you're recounting it, you can feel when you're saying that was my heaven, it, it really comes across. So so that, that seems like it must have been a, a highly interesting and productive time for you. Yeah, yeah. Freedom, total creativity, you know, whatever we did, we, we saw the results out for out uh, from that. Yeah, and I was still longing for a big company. So I, actually, I went for a big company. I understood in the corporation very soon that I'm not a corporate person. So I stayed for three months. I was sitting uh, behind the computer and putting in some data and I said, Oh, no, this is not for me. And uh, I gave up good, good money and uh, I went, uh, you know, elsewhere. I changed a couple of times my occup occupation uh, more than more. More and more, I understood that uh, what I truly want to do is human development. And then I ended up in a consulting company in 1998 with a wise director, a beautiful person who sent me to training the trainers. He saw a potential in me. The lecturer from Britain said, this is your vocation. This is a job you should do because I can see that. I can spot this in you. And in 2001, I went on my own. And ever since, I'm on my own. Nice. 20 years now. Yeah. yeah, wow, congratulations. That is quite the accomplishment. So given that you know this month on Ericsson Life is all about great teams, and we're talking about what are the team dynamics in the online era, how do teams now enter the scene? And the, the topic of teams, how do you become interested in that? How does that become part of your human development journey? And um, what are some experiences you made along the way there? Yeah, this was very particular. One of the subjects that I did in my MBA studies was strategy. I truly like strategic thinking. And I remember I still have it here in my in my files. Uh, we were we were working together with the professor on vision, mission and strategy. And in uh, Harvard Business Review, there were two articles on this. If you ask me what I remember from school, from my MBA studies, I will not tell you much. But I can quote you the things from this article, Vision, Mission, Strategy. I said, this is what we need. Now, I got it in 1994, and on 2001, I went on my own. And my first assignment ever that I got was for Ogilvy Company, which is a worldwide marketing advertising business company. And they approached me with such a question. We know everything about goal setting. We had some courses, but somehow our team, they were 26 people, does not work well together. We don't know what to do about it. I was listening and I said, vision, mission, strategy. What you do not have is a common vision. What you do not share are common values. You never talked about it. And you, you miss a plan how to get there. For me, it was like a ma magnet to magnetize all these people. They were pulling to different uh, 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 to different directions to pull them together. I brought that paper from uh, my files. I read through it. I said, this is going to be the workshop. And I did it with them. We did SWOT analysis. We did value work. We did uh, visioning. I used some pictures that I knew from my previous training on short systemic management i asked them questions and guess what we did it i had very good person in the company who made me a partner that was a lady who wanted to be successful we set up goals for five years everybody was laughing about about it around me because people remembered from communist regime something that we called five year cycles no. you know so people <laughs> said this this lady is crazy but they were open to do it with me and now picture this, they set up goals for three years 
within one and a half year, it was done. The com- it was like magnet for the company. And Ogilvy was a big company. It had something like 220 people in different uh, parts, in different businesses. And when they saw what we did in one business, they asked me to do it in the other businesses. So I was working with Ogilvy business for 18 years. <laughs> that was a, quite a role. And I did a lot of team coaching. I only didn't call it team coaching then because there was not this term available. But basically what I did, I called it those things workshops. So I always said, I'm not going to tell you anything. It's your job. Now tell me what you want. And I did the team coaching. In 2010, I did my PCC. And out of 750 hours that I needed to have, I had over 400 on team coaching or, you know, on these, on these assignments already by then. And I was fascinated because what I did, this, this vision, mission, strategy with one team, it worked everywhere. Basically, it worked everywhere. So I developed step by step my own methodology, how to work with teams, how to make, how to build rapport. I collected games so that they could exchange ideas. I knew that sometimes it was necessary to handle the conflicts, but always, always, it, it was always the same. And so then uh, Marilyn Atkinson came with team coaching. Of course, I passed the course and I enriched my methodologies by also the Ericksonian methodology, which helped me a lot in in structure, putting the structure into the whole process, which is incredible. And uh, my work became even more effective. Okay, so the essence to have a team align and that magnet to pull to pull people together and to really be on the same team for you that's vision mission and strategy and not going to the bar and you know (laughs) having a beer together and uh, having all these um, team building activities that you see you just see in still a lot of organizations being that's what they spend their money on right it's like we have to do something about teams let's spend some money on a party or something like that so maybe let's 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 focus on that for for a second there why is what is it about having the vision the mission and the strategy that makes such great teamwork possible where you say you know we had a goal to reach it in three years we reached it in one and a half because people were just so fired up about it and worked so well together that they just went for it and, and achieved it mm-hmm I would extend that uh, nowadays, you know, with the knowledge that I have, the vision, vision, mission and strategy was like the, the entry into teams. So now I know that there are many more elements that we need to have in place. And when I start working with a team, I have so I, I, wa- I watch, I observe the team, I listen to the team leaders, what the needs are and where they are. And so I know there are many more elements. The strategy, this is really like high level thinking, visioning and thinking about values and mission and the purpose of the team and and the strategy. These are like big milestones. Now we know that there are different kinds of people. People think differently. They, They have different thinking habits. And then there are people that are truly pragmatical. And they say, well, this is really nice to have vision, mission, strategy, but we need to do something today. So I understood that my, you know, my preference of being in visions, mission and strategy, I also need to combine with action steps, with uh, good rules, um, with good communication within the the team. And so there are many more elements in uh, in, uh, good good teams that need to be placed than only this. This I discovered uh, within time, you know. Yeah. Yeah. What, what works for me well, for people who know our school, is uh, nowadays I truly use the four quadrant thinking. Four quadrant thinking means that if you have a team, uh, so what I'm listening for is I'm listening to uh, what is the current performance of the team. This is the physical level. Uh, do they reach the KPIs? How did they set up the KPIs in physical, in the physical quadrants? Is it easy for them? Is it a stretch or is it a stress? Uh, so where they are in terms of this? 
Yeah, and, and just for people, how do they reach the goals? Just for people who are not, you know, aware of the lingo, KPI is key performance indicator. So that's basically the measure by which they um, know, by, by which they get judged on whether they're successful or not. Exactly. Yeah, yeah exactly. And in the phys in this physical quadrant, in performance quadrant, the these KPIs, these uh, measurements, can be, for example, a turnover or a number of customers, or a number of campaigns, or whatever. So that's the first one. So this the, the method, methodology, the Ericksonian methodology that I'm using today um, are, is set up from four quadrants. So that's the first one. The second one that I'm listening for is how is the team doing? What is the, the atmosphere? Are people truly happy? Do they communicate with each other? What is the atmosphere? Do they care about each other? Is there kindness in the team? And, you know, I can tell this to you today, but even a couple of years ago, this was something like, are you crazy? Kindness in the team? Like, care? Where are you from? We are here for money, not for any care. And yet the time is changing. And especially in challenging times that we are living now in, this part becomes hugely important. It's even for me an entry point. If you have a team nowadays online virtual that suffers, well, the performance is not the first thing to take care about. The first thing you need to care about are people. How are people? How are they doing truly? You know, are they, what is their conditions? I don't know how about you guys, but we are in complete lockdown now. Everybody is sitting at home. Uh, people even can't go to the companies, only to special businesses. So the shops are closed. And many people are not used to that. I am on my own for 20 years. I'm used to be in my flat and think for myself. But imagine that many people who are used to go to the company, be in the workplace. Now are, they are suddenly at home. Many people are extroverted. There are something like 75% of extroverts in uh, businesses. This is a statistics. Now, extroverts, people need people to think. They need to talk to somebody. I am an introvert. You know, I can think on my own. I listen to programs. I'm happy. You can but talk what to the plants. These people? That's enough. I can talk to my cat, you know, yeah. or to the plants. Or it's enough for me if I pick up the phone three times a day and I speak with somebody and I am saturated. But extroverts, I was speaking to a manager today in the morning and he told, he, bega he began our discussion today in the morning, Halka, maybe I'm going to resign. I said, what? Like I, I have been working with this leader for three months, four months now. He's extremely successful IT business growing. And suddenly, you know, all of a sudden, he, he tells me I'm going to resign. I, I said, Martin, what's happening? And Martin said, well, you know, it, it's becoming really difficult. I feel cut off from people. Now we have from England, uh, the, the, the information coming from England is not clear. Uh, people are demotivated. I said, and what about your crew? Like you are the captain. What will happen to your people if uh, you will resign? And he said, oh, ah, OK. And, you know, and then we were talking about the conditions and about teams and the companies. And we were talking about these four quadrants. And he said, I never thought about it like this, yeah. that this can be happening and that I'm not alone in this situation all over the planet. Yeah, that's a big thing. And it goes what you're what you're saying um, goes really ties in nicely with with a comment that Mako made uh, when we asked what is your biggest challenge on on remote work and and he says remote remote work makes people become 2D and not 3D anymore i've been working remote yeah. for 14 years yeah. but working remote before the pandemic um and after the pandemic is really different so it's not just before we were working in person and now we're working remotely, but even people who have been working remotely are noticing a shift in people. And, and I, I think it's a really interesting way to express that, no? to, that people are 2D and not 3D anymore. You don't have the full picture, all the dimensions of the people. What, what might yeah. be some ways how you can get that extra dimensions um, when you're working with people, even when it's remotely, even after the pandemic? Yeah, yeah. 
I think this is a great question. I truly see and observe around me the same. People sometimes talk about Zoom fatigue mm. or online burnout because people are sitting on some tools like that from the morning to the evening. And what they are talking about is about performance, is about these KPIs, is about business. And what they are missing is small talks in the kitchen, small talks uh, around the coffee machine, meeting uh, people in the corridors, you know, throwing nice word here and getting nice word here. And so what we are missing, I would not even say the third D, uh, we are missing the heart. And this is for me a remedy. We need to go, 3D is truly meeting with people whenever I can, and it's not possible always, but whenever I can meet one person, I rather than Zoom, I go in the city in Prague, I rather make a meeting with that person live because it feels different. But if I cannot, and this is already like my tips and suggestions, is that what I learned last year from my colleague, whose name is David, he was working for ExxonMobil for 12 years, and he had remote teams already before anything like that started. He had one tip, one technique, and he calls it a cup of time. A cup of time. Yeah, a cup, a cup of time, you know, mm -hmm. a glass of time, a glass of time, a cup of time. And so how does it work? How does the cup of time work? So it works like this. You meet with people online, but instead of jumping into your agenda, which is about performance or conflicts or, you know, business or some small goals or, or what, whatever else, you can distribute people if you are as a team or even if you are as a, as a couple, if you meet with just one person. So instead of talking business, you enter like a sacred space of this cup of time. And in this cup of time, you share with other person something profound or something interesting about yourself. And so, for example, if you work, guys, with Zoom, you get the team together, you create the couples or any other tool that you are using. And the task for people is this. You will go to the teams of two people. You will spend there only five minutes. You have two minutes each. In these two minutes, you will tell to the other person something that the other person does not know about yourself. And it should be something positive. And so you talk to the other person about yourself. You tell him, her, something nice, positive about your childhood. Yeah, like I shared with you, my gymnastic or, you know, Apple story or whatever is interesting about you. You have two minutes, then the other person can ask a couple of questions, but that's it. Two minutes is very short. And then there is a second round, two minutes the other way. And we keep the coaching framework by that. So I teach people also about coaching framers. It should be positive. It should be something about you, something deep. The other person is listening, can pick up the value words, for example, can give them back. But no comments, and especially no commenting on yes, me too, is whatever. So mm. it's one way and the other way. This exercise is seems so easy. It's so incredible. I, I did it many times now because I have been experimented with this exercise for a year now since we are like uh, in this time. So I did it many times. You often ended up with someone, somebody that tells you something that you would tell that person as well. So, uh, for example, I get into a couple with a, with a lady and she said, so I will start and I will tell you something that I, I, I don't tell usually to anybody. I hug trees. And then she was, was talking. She, she was talking for two minutes about hugging trees, and I was sitting like this because I also go hugging trees, and I don't usually talk about it. So there are these, you know, little moments when you say, "I didn't know this about that person." Oh, it's my person, and this is the 4D or 5D, as as we know, because the 4D is the time, you know. So this is how you overcome. 
you truly, we truly need to become interested in people, but truly, like truly deeply. And then the distance and flat screen doesn't matter because we get connected with the hearts. You, you, you can never forget a talk like that with the other person. And you only wait when the lockdown is finished and when we can hug each other instead of trees. <laughs> yeah, that's beautiful. And I just want to emphasize that you share something positive right that is one of the keys to it it's not venting it's not gossiping it's not talking about what's going wrong with the company and how leadership sucks it's taking the moment to actually <sighs> allowing yourself to focus on something positive which which I, i'm guessing with based on my experience makes makes a, a lot of the power makes a lot of the difference that this exercise brings I think this is a shift that is really needed. You know, there is so many suffering and things going around our, ourselves that we definitely need to watch our and be very careful about our thoughts and then about our talks. And because we know in coaching that we can only influence what is in our control, we need to concentrate truly in what our control is. One of the greatest leakages of energy, even according to NASA, you know, in uh, the book how NASA builds teams and uh, we were with Marilyn Atkinson, she gave us a beautiful workshop also on this. Blaming and complaining is one of the biggest holes of energy in teams, mm. but it's very often what's happening because people don't know how to ventilate the stress, how to get rid of it, how to talk about things. So they talk in the corridors or in chats about their stresses. But if it does not end um, in a place where it should be dealt with and we can do something about it, like some constructive, positive, solution-focused, oriented action, then it's only putting an oil into the burn, burnout environment in which we are living in. So we need to be very careful. And with this cup of time, this is like a beginning where I teach to people how beautiful it is to share good stories. It's a precious moment. It's a, it's a moment that you remember, as I remember this lady telling me about the trees. You know, it's becoming a pearl on your necklace. And through that, you can start rebuild the atmosphere in the team through little moments like this, through little switch. So no blaming and complaining, go to, into positives. Yeah, so apparently people are really liking it. Emily is saying, I love the cup of time, consider it stolen with pride. <laughs> so it's yes, a... steal it, steal it. They, <laughs> David gave me all the rights to distribute it to the whole world. Nice. And by the way, that's another technique. Can I share another technique? Please, always. So I have a number of techniques. So I need to become practical. This is what I was learning for many years to become not theoretical, but practical. So this technique goes to the third quadrant. And the third quadrant, if there is a good atmosphere, people start sharing then they start sharing also ideas, observations, and they start learning together, like co-learning, co-sharing. For example, with this friend of mine, David, we have catch-up, we call it catch-up meetings, you know, catch-up. <laughs> uh, well, this is like catch-up, but uh, we, we made it fun, fun of it. So we have catch-up meetings every year, every week. Every week on one day, we have uh, an hour when we catch up. And we have no business together yet. We plan something together, but not, not, we don't have it yet. But we just helped each other through these catch-up meetings. And one day, David told me, you know, I have another good, uh, good technique. And this is teach one, learn one. Teach one, learn one. Learn one. Now I use uh, T1L1, like a short, shortcut, T1, learn one, L1. And this means that every day in a good team, we should, you know, you know I, I follow a number of things. So I, I have full head of new stories and new techniques and all of this. So every day I am calling somebody and I say, look, I learned this today. Can I share this with you? And I teach that thing to a person. And I say, what did you learn during the last week? What's your discovery? And I receive, and this is a technique, teach one, learn one on every day, daily basis, daily routine. 
Now imagine what this can do in a team. If the team start, instead of blaming and complaining, start using their energy into this one. Yeah, it's it's a fundamental mindset shift. So in a lot of organizations that I've worked in uh, as a consultant, yeah. um, knowledge was seen as it's mine. Yeah, it's, it's my yes. basis of power. And I will not share it because otherwise I will lose power compared to you. And... Um, yeah, what you're saying is just resonating with me so much because knowledge is one of those few resources that if you give it away, there's more of it in the world. And that sounds super exactly. corny, but it's it's so true. Yes, it's the truth for learning, for knowledge, and it's also true for, for love. Mm -hmm. The more love you give, the more love there is in, in the flow to you. So this is these two levels in four quadrants. You know, the left one is really caring about people, sharing, developing new communication habits, uh, cultivating dialogues, understanding other people, listening. For me, one of the greatest skills that companies lack is listening, deep listening. People were taught at school in talking. We are all good in talking because we received marks for that. And now we need to switch into listening mode. Like, how is it for you? And uh, so, so how did you live the situation? What was that distracted you on my behavior, being curious? So it's really a big shift. And as you say, the second big shift is there is so much knowledge on the planet that we can't digest it even in this life, even not in the lives coming. So the more I give away, the, 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 the more I can put into my glass, you know? Yeah, and um, <laughs> absolutely. And the, the other thing, and now I lost it for a second. <laughs> Where is it? Um, the other thing that, that, that what you said brought up in me is that... Um, I was no. talking about listening actually, as a skill. Yeah. Um, Let's Learning, sharing, knowledge. Well, well, I mean, one thing that, that I just went to automatically was my experience when I went through the art and science of coaching because it really felt like a virtual classroom, not like a webinar or something, but it really felt like we got to know each other so deeply through coaching each other. And the, the theme that I'm picking up here on, on what we're talking about is really to, if we want to talk in those terms, invest the time to create rapport and to really, really care about each other. Um, and that's not, you know, wasted time. Uh, that's not people just chatting on the company's dime or something like that. That's um, creating the environment in which high performance is possible because you have to care about each other. Otherwise, why bother? Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree with you so much, you know, invest time in people. Now I'm reflecting on that and uh, or what managers and leaders do are not aware of is that when people are in the company, there is really this social contact all the time, really like in Korea. So if you would count, that's my guess. I, I didn't measure this guys anytime. That's my best guess. So when people are working in the companies, they spend maybe 60, 70% of their time on the job and then the rest in, in social contact. Now, this is paid off because people are paid for hours in the job. Now, they are in her, their home office and they miss this time. And managers perceive this time about talking about ourselves as a, a waste of time. Well, this is not a waste of time. It should, it always was a part of the business. And the more we trust ourselves, the, the higher, the, the strongest the bonds there are between people, the higher effectiveness there is in people because we trust each other. So I do not need to have these sites, ideas, how did he think about it? Now, this is also well known from psychology. If we lack information, our brain uh, generates information. So if I don't know how this guy wrote me an SMS or WhatsApp or chat or signal or, uh, you know, I, I don't know, whatever, and I don't know what emotion is behind, well, my brain starts to generate ideas about it, emotions. And guess what? Your emotions, like my emotions, are not going to be the best ones. 
because we will suppose immediately and naturally that there is something behind that against me. And this is the, the these are the misunderstanding and this is the barren out. People do not have enough social contact with each other. So then they go into this suspicious mode. Maybe they want to throw me away. Maybe I will be laid off in the company. Maybe there is a bad thought behind me. Maybe he's dangerous. And this is because we lack social contact. So I would like to challenge social distancing. I would keep guys, physical distancing is fine for now, but please do social bonding as much as you can. And advertising companies, please, could you change this name somewhere? You know, like keep physical distance, but socially, please guys, be even socially more close than ever. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so another theme that I'm picking up on on what we're talking about is that the interaction that it really needs between people it needs to be meaningful, needs to be authentic, needs to be maybe even profound. It's not about did you catch the game last night and oh, what a goal, you know, and, and that sort of thing, because that's kind of so much on the surface that, that there isn't that information that you were talking about, what emotion is behind it and all of that. It's really actually connecting and and really yeah. um getting and listening I, I i'm just underlining what you're saying but it's it's actually not just speaking but actually picking up on what other people are saying and giving them the feeling that they're being heard rather than just waiting for my turn to speak um social interaction from what i'm seeing in the research in the science in the surveys is emerging as the number one factor for our happiness. Yes. I mean, it's again, it's cliche to say money alone doesn't make you happy and all of that. I think we kind of know that by now, but really the number one thing that gets people out of depression, that gets people into a resourceful mindset is talking to people, having the feeling of being yes. heard, having interactions that are meaningful, just being on a train when we were in a they measured um, kind of the the perceived quality of flights and 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 that sort of thing. Yeah. And it's the people that talk to the stranger next to them that have a great time. Yes. It's it's yeah. It's it's the it's the social engagement. Stupid. You know. It's not the economy. It's the it's the it's the social interaction that that really uh, makes all the difference. I agree with you, Fabian, so much. I want to say one thing, and this is that. Um, when uh, people feel lonely and they would be put on uh, measurement machines like fMRI and they would psychologist or neuroscientist would measure the level of pain in people loneliness create the same and even greater level of pain than physical pain the centers are in our brain when people feel lonely and this is what's happening in companies people feel disconnected from the companies also disconnected from the purpose you mentioned one where and this was meaning because they are at home they are reading hundreds of emails a day they are micromanaging then they lack the purpose uh, this is gone if there is nobody who talks about it in a meaningful meetings uh, then uh, people are in details, in operational levels, they get exhausted and moreover they feel alone. And this is a way to hell. We have a hell exercise in our The Art and the Science of Coaching, well that's a journey to hell. So what we need is really, we need to break this social distance uh, scheme, we need social bonding, we need listening skills, we need, as you said beautifully, feeling that we are heard. I feel by you now being heard, you, you are listening to me deeply and such a beautiful feeling, what you provide to me through your listening. We need to put down these curtains that we built over the years and we need authentically start talking about ourselves, talking about our emotions, which, is, which was not the case for the last 2000 years. We need to bring emotions to the table Emotions are part of our lives. They are molecules, molecules running in our veins. Uh, without emotions, there is no motivation. Without emotions, there is no learning. Without emotions, 
there is no life. Our life would be flat without emotions. So we need to start acknowledging them. And there is certain a quality of a, I would call it a feminine energy coming to business now. This is why there is such a big resistance to that because this was perceived as a weak. But according to any teaching, yin and yang, we are back to Aikido or to um, Zen, uh, uh, Zen mastery or yoga even. There is always two energies that create the world. We come from Tao, from the source, but there are two energies that create the world. The young energy, the masculine energy, and we were in this energy. And now we come even through this COVID time to a moment where we need to build up this feminine energy. It's not being weak. In Aikido, stepping out of uh, the attack is not being weak. It's getting a new perspective. And then through the feminine energy in Aikido, you can do something with the partner that doesn't destroy, but yet it can be it can be very effective. So this is something, yeah, that's uh, just coming to my mind also. Yeah, what that brings up for me, I don't know how relevant it is, but but just what brings it that up, what what that brings up for me is that, yeah, I think we do need a lot of feminine energy right now, and women are carrying so much of the burden because in a lot of societies and a lot of cultures a lot of environments where we thought we were further um who gets settled that with both parents working from home who gets settled with working from home and taking care of the kids it's it's the woman it, not everywhere yeah, but but true. that you know and and yeah. that resilience that overcoming that and that just drive to take care of everybody and and keep everything going um is something that I, I don't think anybody can dare call that weak, honestly, uh, after the experience of the last yeah. year. Yeah, yeah. I do have the same information. I, 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 I am in contact with some ladies in business on high positions, now working from at home and saying we have double roles now. It's like a super intensive at this moment. And uh, truly, uh, you know, I, I do not have any ready-made solution like uh, on the table. But I think what what we can say it needs to be appreciated. It's like appreciation and resilience and this strength, uh, feeding the family, taking care of the environment and doing the job. It's like incredible what uh, women truly do there nowadays. Yeah. I want to say also the men because uh, the men suddenly, you know, from this men environment in the companies are at home and it's challenging for both gender, definitely. But if I see some some way out of that, it's truly through communication and through deep communication. We as coaches, we have tools to help people. This is what I also want to, uh, what, what's I, what I see through my work, you know, when I help people to go through these challenges and when I teach them, sometimes I need to teach people how to communicate with each other, how to give feedback, for example, in a non-violent communication way, which is a strategy that's a, a beautiful book, non-violent communication. Bring up the conversation, conversational intelligence. Another great book to read, conversational intelligence from Judith Glazer, a beautiful book to, to read. Um, and then, then changing the mindset and say, we are in this together. So Chinese sign for change, maybe you know, maybe not, but it's fascinating. Chinese sign of change has two meanings. It either danger or opportunity. Yeah. It, and it depends only on your brain, how you perceive that. Do you see current situation as a threat? Or do you see this as an opportunity? And I don't need to say you which one is the way. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a beautiful uh, point to come to a close, Halka. Um, um, be before we before we leave, uh, what might there be um, that we haven't talked about yet that you want to leave people with, where you really where you say, if you only remember one thing, please please remember this and take it with you. Okay, so I have one, and uh, it's kindness. It goes again into this feminine and soft energy and care, let's say, kindness. 
from my colleague David. Uh, he used to tell me one act of kindness sparkles another one. And it's true. If And I know it because I was practicing this last year consciously uh, in the streets, you know, smiling at a stranger, opening a door, letting somebody in the traffic. Anytime I do it for somebody, I benefit immediately. I don't know what's happening in my system, but it's as if, you know, I'm get, getting a, a, a drug. My brain says, how beautiful, how beautiful. So immediately. And I was listening, I'm listening to a meditation guy. His name is Tom Evans. And he says, perform these acts of kindness. They have to be random. Random people, not to a person that you know, but random, randomly, to a person that cannot return that kindness to you. And just observe what's happening. And do this three times a day. And an interesting point that I heard in this today in the morning when I was listening to a meditation and to a lady that created a company called Peace Beam like a beam of peace, peace beam. You can find it. I'm new to that, but lady was very interesting. Peace beam. She said, yes, kindness is a way. And maybe there is no mistake in a word, human kind. Ah. Human kind. Yeah, beautiful. Well, thank you so much for that, Halka. Um, There you have it, everybody. Kindness. Kindness is the key. Performing random acts of kindness uh, can boost your resilience. It can boost your happiness. Uh, It just gives you a shot in the arm um, better than any energy drink or any coffee. Um, Yeah, Halka, sorry. What what would you like to add? I know we are over the time, you know. So what I want to stress and I truly want these people to leave with the first person that we need to be kind with is ourselves. Mm. And this I truly mean. This was my way to teamwork, so I can finish like, you know, from being very individualistic into teamwork. I went through quite a deep depression for several years, and when I was getting out and I was asking myself what led me there, I realized that, you know, this performance drive all the time, and I said, I need to change that. So I truly want to have true friends. I want to be authentic to people and I want to go in this direction. So I started to talk to people. I started to use coaching skills to have coaching dialogues with people. It's like coaching conversation. It's not coaching, but it's a dialogue where you use coaching skills to know more about people and perform these acts of kindness. And then somewhere I heard, but the first person we need to be kind with is ourselves because also we bear on our shoulders so many past generations, epigenetically the burdens from the past. And yeah, that's it, you know, the first person we need to act kindness upon to are ourselves guys as well. So that's perhaps the end from my side. That might be the hardest one to be kind to, um, depending on where we're at. Um, but in many ways, the most important one. So let us challenge you. What might be one act of kindness you can do for yourself today? And what might be a random act of kindness you can do for others? Um, and hey, if you're up for it, maybe try that for a week and see how you feel. See what changes. Just observe. Become a little more mindful around kindness in your life or towards your teammates. If we bring it back to team coaching and, and teamwork, um, what might be a small favor you can do very quickly for somebody in your life? And what might be a favor they can do for you? How might you help them help you? Because if you let yourself be helped by them, you're giving them the gift of feeling amazing because they could do a favor to somebody. That's a, it's a huge mind shift that I came across recently. So um, yes, um, try it out. Let us know how it how it goes. Um, you know, you can always come back to this replay and say, I tried this out and it worked. Or, or, or something along those lines. We'll be curious to read that. Um, and uh, Halka, thank you so, so much. We are so out of time, but I could talk to you, you know, for the, for the rest of this week about this. 
Um, so uh, thank you. And um, yeah, I'm sure we'll be talking on this program again soon. Super, thank you everybody. I send big hugs all over the globe to Yassi in Brazil and uh, you know, to you guys wherever you are sitting. Yes, Emily, and, uh, Nairobi, Benjamin in France, um, uh, people all over, um, lots of love, lots of kindness from us. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> big, big family, we are a big family. Yes. Big hugs guys and uh, have a beautiful whatever time of the day you have. We have evening. <laughs> Take care. Bye. And thank you, Fabienne. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Halka. Thank you so much.